Is the sound heard this way or not? Thank you, Dr. Nabil. Yes. We hear you. Don't mention it. Okay. I, I, I'm going to start my presentation. Uh, my presentation is about enhanced recovery pathways uh, lead to better patient outcomes. As a matter of fact, this is evidence-based. What do we mean by enhanced recovery? Is it early recovery from surgery? As some of us might think, no. It's early recovery of surgery in addition to returning to his normal life and work. That's what's meant by enhanced recovery, returning to his normal life and work. Enhanced recovery is a multimodal perioperative care pathway uh, leading to early recovery from surgery, uh, diminishing the profound stress following surgical intervention, and in the meantime, maintaining the preoperative organ function. We've got key elements for the enhanced recovery protocol. First of which is preoperative counseling, operative uh, uh, optimizing the nutrition and standardizing the early motion. As enhanced recovery is to some extent new, anything which is new finds resistance against the traditional uh, methods. Uh, does enhanced recovery offer us a better patient outcome? Uh, what are the cornerstones of the crucial elements which, uh, on which enhanced recovery depends? The active role of the patient. The patient is not passive in enhanced recovery. The patient is in the heart of the pathway and has got an active role. Does enhanced recovery make a difference? It improves the quality of care, it reduces morbidity, efficient cost reductions, and improve delivery of care. Enhanced recovery, the introduction. Enhanced recovery after surgery uh, protocols are multimodal perioperative care pathways designed to achieve three items. First of which is early recovery after surgical procedures, Secondly, maintaining preoperative organ function. And thirdly, reducing the profound stress response following surgery. So it's, as I said, it's a multimodal perioperative care pathway. It's a multidisciplinary teamwork. It's not a single work, it's multi teamwork. And the patient is in the heart of the pathway. The key elements for enhanced recovery protocols include, first of all, Preoperative counseling, optimization of nutrition is of utmost importance, and we should have standardized analgesic and anesthetic regimens because anesthesia and analgesia play a vital role in enhanced recovery, uh, early mobilization of the patient. So, if we're giving the anesthesia or analgesia in a way which will not offer the patient early mobilization, we've done nothing this way. Despite the significant body of evidence indicating that ERAS protocols lead to improved outcomes, they challenge traditional surgical doctrine, and as a result, their implementation has been slow. So as I said before, the implementation of enhanced recovery, it should grow faster than this very much. But traditional ways or uh, some of the surgeons, they resist this way of enhanced recovery. But anyhow, now it's spreading very widely and is spreading in different uh, surgical interventions and even in acute medicine. There's now uh, uh, an intention of enhancing the recovery in inpatient acute medicine. We've seen that the spread of enhanced recovery pathways to many surgical specialities beyond the original four main areas. It first started at the colorectal in Sweden, then 
it extended to gynecology, orthopedics, and urology, and now it extended to further uh, subspecialties. There is now a serious move to adoption of similar principles in acute medicine. Anyhow, successful adoption and application of enhanced recovery pathways will result in the following. First of all, it will give more empowered patients. It will give a better functioning team. It will increase the bed capacity because the patient won't stay a long time in hospital, only 24 hours. Uh, fewer post-operative complications. In the meantime, reduction in hospital costs. So the benefits of enhanced recovery are marvelous. As I said, empowered patient, better functioning team, increased bed capacity, and the reduction in hospital costs, in addition to uh, fewer post-operative complications. Anyhow, the future delivery of medical care will need to focus not only on the development of innovative treatments, but on reducing the levels of stress associated with the delivery of inpatient care. As we said before, enhanced recovery leads to diminution of the stress. Now the delivery of medical care will depend upon, uh, or will tend to reduce the levels of stress in addition to development of innovative treatments. The enhanced recovery pathways provides an evidence-based means of achieving this with an increasing number of surgical and medical subspecialties. The evidence base for enhanced recovery is clear and continues to be strengthened with the ongoing spread and adoption of the pathway across different countries. So it's now spreading worldwide. What are the four working principles or the crucial pillars which enhance it? First of which is that all patients should be in a pathway to enhance their recovery. That patient preparation should give the patient in the best possible condition. That patient management is through the entire pathway that's preoperatively during and after operation and treatment, and that the patient should have an active role and take responsibility. So all patients should be in a, on a pathway to enhance the, the recovery. This enables patients to recover from surgery, treatment, illness, and leave hospital sooner by minimizing the physical and psychological stress responses. In the meantime, the patient preparation should ensure the patient to be in the best possible condition, identifies the risk, and commences rehabilitation even prior to admission or as soon as possible. The proactive management components of enhanced recovery are embedded across the entire pathway, as I said before, preoperatively during and after the operation and treatment. And finally, which is the most important, that the patients have an active role and take responsibility for enhancing the recovery. In the past, the patient used to be passive, but now the patient is, has got an active role, has got a responsibility, and shares in decision making, and this uh, enhances his recovery. Enhanced recovery could be used with laparoscopic surgery with open surgery it is an integrated pathway that takes a multimodal evidence-based approach to optimize the patient recovery so it could be used in any type of surgery nowadays whether laparoscopic or open body surgery does enhanced recovery make a difference or what are we going to gain from enhanced recovery Enhanced recovery is common sense. First of all, it improves the quality of care. It improves the delivery of care. 
it reduces the morbidity. So, in simple terms, it improves the quality of care and supports patients to get better sooner after major surgery. In the meantime, it improves the delivery of care, reduces post-operative complications, improves the patient experience, and reduces unnecessary length of stay and makes efficient cost reduction. And this is a very important point. In addition to the quality improvements, enhanced recovery makes a significant contribution in reducing morbidity, translating into real cost savings. This table summarizes uh, different points in enhanced recovery. So enhanced recovery message is uh, instantly recognizable. First of which is a best practice care with compelling evidence base, patient partnership at the heart of the pathway, enhanced re recovery, minimize the stress patients go through, patient preparation is the key to the success of the enhanced recovery, and we shall speak about this in this. I apologize for the mistake. Uh, Enhanced recovery involves a number of components when implemented as a group. Patients get better sooner and fitter. Access and equity in care. Enhanced recovery supports the spread of innovation, which is very important as an integral part of the pathway that's intraoperative fluid management technologies, which is goal-directed fluid management. Enhanced recovery proved to be the right pathway. It offers fewer complications, better outcomes, cost-effective and better patient experience. Enhanced recovery is a solution that supports many priorities locally and nationally. The clinical case for enhanced uh, recovery practice for all patients and representing good care is clear. So enhanced recovery improves the quality of care. Enhanced recovery messages are instantly recognizable as we've shown in the previous table. It's the best practice care pathway with a compelling evidence base the patient partnership is at the heart of the pathway. The patient has got an active role in enhancing his recovery. Uh, in the meantime, uh, it minimizes the stress patients go through. For instance, uh, in enhanced recovery, we let the patient come on the day of the operation. You shouldn't leave, get him the night before. This is to diminish the stress response. In the meantime, if we've got, for instance, uh, for cesarean section, if we're getting the patient for cesarean section, we shouldn't get all patients at eight o'clock. We should arrange it in a way that the patient wouldn't stay a long time. So patient preparation is the key to success of enhanced recovery. Patients get better sooner, fitter, and return home sooner, returning to normal life, work, and play. As I said before, enhanced recovery is not just recovering early from surgery, but it's returning to his normal life, work, and play. Enhanced recovery supports the spread of innovation as an integral part of the pathway, so intraoperative fluid management technologies. Enhanced recovery is the care pathway, fewer complications, better outcomes, cost-effective, and in the meantime, better patient experience. The wider applications and opportunities for enhanced recovery. It's now exploring with clinical teams the transferability of the principles and components into other areas, such as emergency surgery, 
vascular surgery, abdominal aortic aneurysm, esophageal, gastric, lung, liver, pancreatic, and cesarean sections. Some teams are already testing these in areas with early indications of good results. So it's spreading widely nowadays. As a matter of fact, enhanced recovery fulfills the potential. It is a better journey for the patient and a better deal for the organization. So shared decision making, clarifying the range of treatment options, uh, optimizing preoperative hemoglobin levels, managing pre-existing comorbidities, discharge planning and liaising with social care, admission should be on the day of surgery, optimizing fluid hydration, in the meantime, carbohydrate loading and reducing starvation. So in the very start, we said that optimization of nutrition is the key of success to enhance recovery. In enhanced recovery, we don't use uh, oral bowel preparation or reduce oral bowel preparation in cases of bowel surgery. There is planned mobilization. As we said, early mobilization is the key to success. Rapid hydration and uh, nourishment, appropriate intravenous therapy. We shouldn't have wind, uh, wound drains, no wound drains. No nasogastric tube. This is different from the traditional ways which have been used. Catheters should be removed early. In the meantime, we use uh, regular paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs instead of morphia, we should avoid systemic opiates as much as possible. As we said before, enhanced recovery includes shared decision-making with the patient, mild uh, healthy medical condition, informed and shared decision-making, preoperative health and risk assessment, patient information and expectation managed, discharge planning. Discharge planning should be discussed with the patient, expected date of discharge, preoperative therapy instruction is appropriate, as appropriate. In the meantime, uh, in surgery, we should use minimally invasive surgery. We should use transverse incision if abdominal, we should use regional or local anesthesia. With sedation, it's better than general anesthesia. Epidural management, including thoracic epidural, and we should optimize the fluid management technology to deliver individualized goal-directed fluid therapy and discharge when criteria uh, are met. So in enhanced recovery, there is a different technique than the traditional way, as you said, we try not to have nasogastric tubes, bowel preparation should be reduced, uh, and things of that sort. The enhanced recovery surgical pathway passes through six stages. Primary care, patient uh, preparation, admission, intraoperative, post-operative, and even post-discharge. And in each item of this, we've got several items to discuss. So in the primary, uh, in the role of the primary care, we should have shared decision-making, clarifying the range of treatment options, optimizing preoperative hemoglobin levels is a must, managing pre-existing comorbidities, and discharge planning and liaising with social care. That's as regards the primary care. As regards the patient preparation, we should have shared decision making, optimized health medical condition, informed shared decision making, preoperative health risk assessment, patient information and expectation managed, discharge planning expected days of discharge. So in every step, 
the patient should be aware of what's going to happen to him and what's the prognosis. As regards the admission, we should have admission on the day of surgery, as I said before, we should optimize the fluid hydration, carbohydrate loading, and reduce starvation. No reduced oral bowel preparation in bowel surgery. Concerning the intraoperative, we should have minimally invasive surgery. As we said, we should use transverse incisions, no nasogastric tube, regional or local anesthesia or sedation, epidural management, and optimized fluid management leading to directed fluid bowl therapy. Concerning the post-operative, we should have planned mobilization. We said that early mobilization is the key to success. Rapid hydration and nourishment, appropriate intravenous therapy, no wound drains, no nasogastric tube, catheters should be removed early. We should have regular oral analgesia and uh, paracetamol and nostroidal anti-inflammatory drugs instead of morphia, avoiding of systemic opiates. Concerning the post-discharge care, uh, discharge should occur when the criteria are met with. So, if enhanced recovery has produced such dramatic improvements in surgery, would all inpatients, including acute medicine, benefit from a similar approach? That's the trend nowadays. That sure they shall benefit. What about enhanced recovery in emergency surgery? It could be used in emergency fractured neck femur or emergency laparotomies, as we said before, uh, development of an enhanced recovery care pathway. Nowadays, enhanced recovery is used on a wide spectrum in obstetrics, and we should have principles to be fulfilled antenatally. First of all, we should maximize the antenatal well-being. We should ensure that hemoglobin would be optimized and consider prophylactic iron, proactive breastfeeding, creation of elective caesarean list with designated times to attend rather than all time at 8 p.m., as I said, uh, 8 a.m., sorry, after midnight. So. Caesarean section nowadays, the patient stays in hospital maximum 24 hours, not more, if it went on uh, smoothly. We should encourage the women to eat and drink right up to the cutoff times, which is six and two hours before the rapper time. We should give energy drinks to have two hours before the proposed section time, where if the procedure is delayed, we should give further drinks. Appropriate psychological preparation of going home after 24 hours and explanation of what to expect with regards to pain. So pain should be avoided postoperatively by giving paracetamol, as I said, and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or we can use the patient computerized analgesia. Enhanced recovery is safe care seven days a week. So there's a phone number which any uh, person can phone 24 hours a day to ask about anything uh, he needs. What are the benefits of enhanced recovery? First of all, improvement in the quality of care, improvement in the outcome, improvement in patients' expectations, experience, and efficiency, and in the meantime, reductions in unnecessary length of stay. 
As regards quality and outcomes, we've got improved clinical outcomes, early detection of risks, reduction in complications, earlier intervention treatments, example, chemotherapy, no increases in readmissions, uh, the proactive pathway management, improved coordination, communication, and cooperation. As I said before, it's a multidisciplinary teamwork and doesn't depend upon uh, one person only. Supporting integrated care and multidisciplinary teamwork making across the entire pathway. What about the patient involvement and experience? Patients get better sooner, return to their normal activities sooner. The agreed care partnership with patients have a clear role and responsibility for enhancing their own recovery. As I said, the patient is in the heart of the pathway and the patient has got an active role and responsibility. Uh, reduce exposure to risks, example, hospital acquired infections. So when the patient stays in the hospital for a longer period, he might get acquired infections. Building the patient's confidence and trust in care delivery, supporting shared decision making. So the patient participates in the decision, you should give him the choices, and as far as they're all okay for him, he chooses the way which he likes. In the meantime, it improves satisfaction. Concerning the efficiency, there is reduction in the unnecessary lengths of stay in hospital, reduction in duplication of tests, reduction in canceled theater lists, release bed capacity, bed days saved in high dependence units. So uh, there's great benefit from enhanced recovery as regards the bed capacity of the hospital. And there is no cancellation in theater lists in enhanced recovery here nowadays. In the past, when I used to work in the Royal Free Hospital in London, there is nothing such as the patient would be postponed as far as it is fit even if you stayed working till nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, whatever the condition is, nothing called cancellation. In enhanced recovery, as far as you get the patient in the proper, appropriate time, he'll do his operation and no cancellation. Concerning innovation, the spread and adoption of enhanced recovery principles across specialities and clinical teams. Uh, now, new learning and research opportunities, example, acute medicine, intraoperative fluid managed, uh, management technologies, as I said, goal-directed fluid therapy. Enhanced recovery, continues to demonstrate the benefits of its evidence-based team approach to practice improvement with the patient at the heart of that team. So the challenge now is widespread implementation of this good practice in a robust and supported way, ensuring all eligible patients have access to the highest standards of care. So the problem now is the implementation of this new technique, although it's not new nowadays, but uh, it's widely spread nowadays because it offers better outcome. The Royal College of Anesthetics of Great Britain and Ireland strongly supports the integrated care pathways the enhanced recovery programs offers both medical and patient engagement in a process of identifying needs. So, as we said before, that there is better means of communication between the medical team and the patient. In other words, we're tailoring care from referral to recovery. 
The enhanced recovery program is an important development in improving the care of patients undergoing surgery. Enhanced recovery requires the building of a multidisciplinary team, as I said before, that crosses organizational and functional boundaries is about the entire pathway of care. Patient preparation is the key to success. The preparation of the patient includes the following items. First of all, provide health screening prior to referral. For referring the patient, health screening should occur. And mental health conditions. So any problem should be managed before sub the patient being subjected to surgery. Discuss treating options and choices as part of their decision making. Promote the patient's understanding their role and responsibilities in enhancing their own recovery. Bring more aspects of preparation closer, uh, closer to home. So if he needs, for instance, physiotherapy, let him go to place nearby his home before entering the hospital. Identify the physical, psychological, and social conditions. So patient preparation, as we said before, is the key to success as we've enumerated all the items regarding patient preparation. Concerning preoperative assessments, the patient preoperative assessment appointment is important. This is about and of good planning, identifying and managing the risk, continuing to keep the patient fully informed and involved in the shared decision making. In the meantime, offering a date for preoperative assessment when appropriate. In many cases, this is on the same day of the decision for surgery is made, so therefore date and time for admission can be agreed. That preoperative assessment occurs before the patient enters the hospital. Preoperative assessment, mostly or they prefer it to occur on the day in which the decision to make surgery will be taken, and in this way, you can agree with the patient upon the appropriate date and time. We should have preoperative assessment clinics carefully. And in these clinics, the anesthetist should play a crucial role. This will enable timely patient assessment of patients fitness for surgery. This helps to reduce operation cancellations, repeated tests, unnecessary procedures, and provide timely informed consent. The consent of is, uh, is of utmost importance. Declare that the patient knows everything about the operation, about the risks, about the technique, about uh, whether it's general anesthesia or local anesthesia. Uh, uh, this preoperative assessment reduces the operation cancellation. Never an operation will be cancelled on table because it's been seen before and given fitness. In this condition, we should give the gear all gear all operative assessment. As regards preoperative risk, the structure of the perioperative risk assessment should be designed to, uh, to provide both a generic and procedure specific assessment. So the patients should have access to all necessary information. This occurs abroad, it's always this way, and continue to be actively involved in decision making and informed consent, uh, consent process. And by the way, I'll say something that occurred while I was in the real free hospital in London. Professor Hobbs, one of the most senior consultants of surgery, there was a patient who had, uh, he, he needed a baloney amputation, 
and this patient was insane. So his parents signed for the operation. He was in diabetic ketoacidosis before giving anesthesia. He was prepared for anesthesia. He recovered, and Professor Hobbs told him that you need baloney amputation. He refused the operation and said, it's my leg and not my parents' leg, and I won't sign the consent. So Professor Hobbs told him, you are insane. Now it's below knee amputation. Later it will be above knee amputation. Later, later it will be disarticulation. Anyhow, he refused the operation. Professor Hobbs said that after 20 years, I have seen this patient coming and I didn't forget his face. I'm looking for crutches under his shoulders. I found no crutches. So the patient told me, yes, it's me. And thanks to God that I was insane and refused. So the consent is of utmost importance and it's the right of the patient to accept or refuse. The preoperative assessment should be carried out by trained and competent uh, competent preoperative assessment assessors who should be able to order and perform basic in investigations and make referrals according to the needs by the clinical team. So uh, it's a must to have pre competent pre assessment assessors. Improvements in preoperative assessment and preparation, perioperative care, and postoperative support have provided an important reduction in the mortality rates, which has in turn provided savings in terms of ICU, high dependence unit beds, days per patient, as well as decreasing the number and severity of complications suffered by patients following surgery. So preoperative assessment plays a vital role, a crucial role in the reduction in the mortality rates. As regards the cardiopulmonary exercise testing, this is done in all serious cases in which you expect in major surgery or high-risk surgical intervention. Objective assessment on functional or exercise capacity using cardiopulmonary exercise testing is increasingly being used to assess perioperative risk in major surgery. Consideration should be given to performing the cardiopulmonary exercise test in any preoperative patient who has increased risk or is scheduled to undergo a high-risk surgical intervention. Cardiopulmonary exercise test benefits patients helps to simplify them into post-operative care, whether in a ward or in a high dependence unit or in the intensive care unit the setting. What about anesthetics? Anesthetics are of crucial and vital importance. They minimize the risk. Uh, we should minimize the risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting. We should avoid nitrous fight. We should use anti-emetics and prescribe first-line rescue anti-emetics routinely. Anesthetics are a key role in enabling early mobilization. So anesthesia must be effective to allow early mobilization. Whenever it's possible, regional anesthetic techniques or nerve blocks should be used and long acting opiates used should be avoided. Erect paracetamol and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents will reduce opiate requirements. Uh, where regional analgesia can be used, as I said before, patient-controlled analgesia uh, could be used. A combination of analgesic regime, that is paracetamol and ibuprofen, maybe with minimal intravenous morphia, if not contraindicated, it can be very effective at reducing morphia use, uh, usage. So paracetamol and ibuprofen will diminish the use of morphia. 
The advantages of using spinal analgesia include the following items. First of all, lower insertion failure rates, lower rate of complications. In the meantime, patients can mobilize sooner. Epidurals, on the other hand, provide excellent analgesia, but they do not always maximize mobilization. Other approaches include local anesthesia, injection techniques, or tab block. Analgesia in abdominal surgery is a must. We should maintain normal therapy pre and post operatively, intraoperative fluid management, uh, central volemia, which should uh, respond to volume therapy that is fluid bolus. If you give a fluid bolus, central hypovolemia should respond immediately. Uh, the indicators of central hypovolemia are tachycardia, uh, whenever blood or fluid loss, hypotension, cold peripheries, low CVP, low cardiac output, reduced stroke volume, and pulse pressure variation during intermittent positive pressure ventilation, preload responsiveness, and low central venous oxygen. Now, the general principles of enhanced recovery management is to maintain good preoperative hydration, give carbohydrate drinks preoperative, use intraoperative fluid management technologies to, de to, to deliver individualized directed fluid therapy. In the meantime, avoid crystallite excess, which will lead to salt and water overload and avoid post-operative intravenous fluids, encourage post-operative drinking and eating. Finally, what about the patient's role and responsibility in enhancing the, their own recovery, which is a crucial uh, element in uh, the success of enhanced recovery. Patients have an active role in enhanced recovery, the most important involvement is along the care pathway itself. The enhanced recovery pathway asks patients to play in the care before, during, and after hospital admission. So the active role of where patients in the past have been ascribed more parallel the sick road. Aligning patients with those who are delivering the service is critical to success. So the patient is informed about everything and there is always discussion between him and the medical team. So enhanced recovery is not just patient focused it is patient-centered. That is to say, its approach goes beyond just delivering the best possible clinical outcome for the patient. Crucially important that is, it exceeds this aspiration by recognizing that for the person experiencing the surgery, the clinical aspects of the whole process are just some of the means to optimum recovery in the shortest possible time. So, Everything that's going to happen to the patient should be explained to him prior to surgery. What does patient empowerment mean for enhanced recovery? That is to achieve optimal recovery in the shortest possible time. As a conclusion, enhanced recovery pathways are clinically focused, most effective patient-driven pathways with an evidence base in improving quality comes due to team working. Enhanced recovery is the right pathways with fewer complications, better outcomes, more cost-effective, and better patient experience. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Nabil. I think the problem, as you highlighted in the first 
that it is the implementation. Now we have many questions, but just, just before uh, we just search for the questions, now it is time for the poll. Walid, you are ready for the poll about the uh, power of the presenters? About? The poll about the uh, reaction of the attendee towards the presenter. This is the first one. Yeah, yeah. Second poll, Walid, please, to go to the questions. We'll leave uh, it just, just for 30 seconds more, or you can go away for okay. the questions and I'll put the second Just, one. just uh, bef before we go to the question, Dr. Nabil, what about your, uh, your own experience about the uh, negotiation with the surgeon, with the patient, about the importance? I I'm ask asking about the implementation. How far you succeeded, and uh, a little bit on another field, but yeah. you for the implementation. How is this your own experience about the motivation yeah. of surgeon and patients about to go towards the uh, early recovery steps? Well, at the present time, to my own mind, it depends upon the character of the anesthetist, and it depends upon the relation between the anesthetist and the surgeon. And so you can convince the surgeon that in this way he live within 24 hours. In the meantime, you're convincing the patient himself by enhanced recovery, early mobilization. So there's no problem as it used to be. But this needs special culture. Not all patients will accept this. It depends upon the culture. And not all surgeons will accept it. Going to the first questions for the attendee about the uh, Dr. Ibrahim Salim. Abdullah, Abdullah, Abdurrahim Salim, please, who is the team leader? Uh, he's just asking, I think, this administration point Ex of view. Excuse me? Team leader. Yeah. Yes. Who will be the team leader? If we consider a team, for example, the team between nurse, anesthesia, and surgeon, and administration, and physiotherapy, and nutritionist, who will be the team And leader? the patient himself. A patient himself, yeah. And family. To my own mind, the, the, to my own mind, the team leader is always the anesthetist. In the armed yeah. forces, always the team leader used to be the anesthetist. And okay, it's multidisciplinary teamwork. It's teamwork. We, we, we don't say leader so that we wouldn't uh, lose the surgeon. But anyhow, it's uh, multidisciplinary teamwork, integrated teamwork. We, we can say uh, yeah, it's someone's always, about uh, might be a little bit uh, mild. We can say the coordinator. Uh, I don't get the question, please. Uh, uh, we can say, instead of saying the team leader, we can say the coordinator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Another question from Raheem Salim. What screening tool can be used uh, to identify patients that will require cardiopulmonary exercise testing? Cardiopulmonary exercise what, tests, what was yeah, the first part of the tools, question? What screening, yeah, what screening tools can be used for to identify patients that will require uh, uh, cardiopulmonary exercise I said the high risk patients, as I said before, and yeah. if we were expecting any sort of complication, the cardiopulmonary exercise testing will offer us uh, a better uh, intervention and will inform us about if the patient should go to high dependence unit, intensive care unit, or the ward. Uh, another two questions about is the smoke cessation is a part of enhanced recovery? Smoke cessation is it a part the question, of please. Smoke, the smoke, smoke okay. Uh, smoke well, cessation. Yeah, yeah. Smoke cessation. Yeah, yeah. I agree with. You. I, I got it this way. Uh, it's a part of enhanced recovery, and even in, in normal surgery, it should be. Smoke should be stopped. In enhanced Last recovery. Question, yeah. You have just explained about uh, spinal and epidural and its role in uh, recovery, early recovery. Analgesia. But, I said as yes. regard. Yeah, yeah. Analgesia. I'm just uh, another question about spinal morphine or spinal narcotics. 
is it allowed in the enhanced recovery? No, it's not. Our, we said that the success of enhanced recovery is due to early mobilization. Yeah. So sp spinal mm. narcotics won't offer early immobilization. It's according the length of the operation. If it's given in a diluted way, it's okay. The, and as I said before, the epidural will offer better analgesia, but it will hinder the early mobilization. So the okay. spinal shouldn't. It's better not to give morphia. We should avoid morphia as much as you can. Uh, thank you, Professor Nabil, for your patience to ask all these questions. And I think uh, it is our duty to uh, transform the knowledge written or uh, innovated by it's surgeons to the surgeon. Yes, it is innovated by surgeons, but nowadays the most uh, refusing parts of the team is the surgeons. So thank you, Professor Nabil. Thank you, Professor Samir Ansari, for these two heavy Figures topics. Always... Uh, for these two heavy topics. And I think now uh, we should take some dinner, a cup of tea, to go to the bed. That's because we are very, 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 very uh, full of knowledge about the early recovery and the total parental nutrition. Thank you, Walid. Thank you, Professor Nabil. Thank you, Professor Samir Ansari. Thank you all attendees from the panelists. Uh, I think all of most of them. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Magdi, for your uh, presentation. It, it uh, was honor to, to me uh, to attend uh, with you this presentation. I want to thank Dr. Dr. Magdi and Dr. Nabil. Uh, really uh, uh, amazing and attractive lecture, Dr. Dom Nabil. Uh, very nice, really, presentation. Thanks for you. We are enjoyed, really. With this Thank event. you very much. Thank you. It was sir. my honor and my delight. So thanks very much, everyone here. And uh, it's my pleasure always to close the session. Uh, see you next Saturday, 9 p.m. Cairo International Time uh, with two, one anesthesia and one ICU lectures. Hopefully, stay safe and see you next week. Assalamu alaikum. If you can try to make it earlier, it would be better, as some people ask for this. If you A can. lot of people are actually asking for that. It's now earlier in Ireland, so I'm afraid if it happens oh, better, okay. I wouldn't be able to make it. That's the only problem here. Okay. Thanks Thank so much. You very much. See you Thank all you next all. week. Thank you.